Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. Uh, tonight, what we're going to be doing is going through still the book of Enoch. We're getting into section four, Enoch's calendar. And this is kind of important because if we have the calendar right, we can uh, find out what's going on in scripture. So if Jesus does something or Moses does something or some event occurs, and they say it was the third day of whatever month, and then they say five days later, something happens. Well, you'll know exactly what day of the month it is, what day of the week it is, if it's close to a Sabbath or a festival or other events that are marked on their calendar, their historical calendar. So you really understand it well. And if you, if you think about this, since we all believe that nothing's written in scripture to just be filler, when it tells us something happened, and then three days later, something happened. There's a reason to tell us three days. And if it was just a few days later, then who cares? What difference does it make? Well, there's some reason for it to be there. And if we have a calendar like our calendar, Gregorian, there's really no way to figure that out. It was, it was on a Tuesday, five days later, something happened. That doesn't tell us anything. Or the sixth of the month. We don't know what day of the week that was. On our calendar you would on this calendar we're going to explore that tonight so let's go ahead and start off by going to that section as you can see here we finished up the fallen angel section uh chapters 6 to 16 skipping over a lot of stuff in the middle enoch's calendar that section is between uh, chapter 72 and 82. we're going to specifically look at two two uh two chapters tonight, or big pieces of the two chapters, on how the calendar works. So let's start off by looking at the calendar in general. We'll start with from our calendar, which is the Gregorian one, which is what we use. The Americans, most, most of the world uses the ancient Roman calendar, kind of revamped. So what happened was in 46 or 48 BC, Julius Caesar revamped the calendar. And from that point on, we have the Julian calendar named after Julius Caesar. And all the way up through the Middle Ages, uh, we used the same calendar. Then it was realized that it wasn't quite perfect for the leap day system. So right now, the way it works, and most of us are just aware of part of it, every four years, we have a 365 day year. But every four years, we have an extra day, a, three, a 300 uh 66th day and that puts us back in in check well uh over a few thousand years that's not quite perfect enough so it got off in the middle ages and so they redid that redoing the leap system made it the gregorian calendar as opposed to the julian calendar but it's still the ancient roman calendar that's the only difference so now if the if it's the end of a century like when the year 2000 came in kind of came or the year of a millennium rather uh, if it's uh the a, a millennium then you do not count that leap year so normally every four years that would skip there'd be eight years in between the two unless of course that millennium or that hundred year period actually is divisible by 400. there's a few other little rules in that but it's kind of irrelevant for us because it won't happen again in our lifetime. So basically, we have the calendar we know, which is January to December. The year changes for some weird reason right in the middle of winter. No particular date. Uh, and the way time is me measured anciently, and we're going to see this in a little bit, is by solstices and equinoxes. So... Uh, the spring equinox always used to be the beginning of the year when everything used to bloom and then we would go forward and somehow that was changed at a certain point. So to give you an example of this, uh, we have January through December. January was the first month. It was renamed after Janus, who was one of the first emperors of the Roman Empire back about a thousand B.C., or, or even further back, actually. Um, and then he became known as the, the god of two faces, the god, god Janus. Most people think he was fictional, but the month is named after him. 
And then, of course, July is named after Julius Caesar, and August is named after Augustus Caesar. So some of the names got changed. But if you think about it, the last four months, which should be uh, 8, 9, 10, and 11, and 12, or 9, 10, 11, and 12, the last four months. But if you look at those on the calendar, they're called September, October, November, and December. So if you look at Sept, Oct, Ness, and Desi, that would be 7, 8, 9, and 10. So if they are the 9, 10, 11, and 12th month, why are they named 7, 8, 9, and 10? What happened to 11 and 12? Well, 11 and 12 are January and February. That gets us to March when we would have a spring equinox, the beginning of the year. Another interesting fact is if you had to have a leap day, because this is a leap year, a leap week, month, day, whatever, where would you put the leap day? You'd put it at the end of the year. So why don't we put it on January 32nd? That'd be the end of our year. Uh, well, we don't. We put it at the end of the old year. The old month was February, because in March uh, is the uh, beginning of the of the year. So there's a lot of interesting comments about that or little facts you can put together to show that anciently the calendar started in the spring, not in the dead of winter. So there's a lot of interesting things like that. We have 12 months of a random number of, of days. And it's, it's very odd if you think. It's either 28, 29, 30, or 31 days. And the modern Jewish calendar is like that. The modern Jewish calendar was created by Hillel, uh, I believe, in the second or third century. And they basically made up a lot of rules to have so many months, so, so much of it done. Basically, the way that it works today is every, every uh, almost every three years, I think it's nine times in 17 years, there is a leap month. And so it is a lunar calendar or a semi-lunar solar combination type calendar. And um, the way that it works is each month starts at a new moon. So it's all about moon phases. And we have been told throughout history that that's the way the biblical uh, God's calendar worked. And apparently that's not exactly the case. And so we're going to see that. So this was going to talk about the ancient calendar. So let's look at that. Let's start with uh, this section. I'm just going to read the, the outline so you can kind of know. Uh, it talks about the fact that there's a zodiac. So there are these star patterns. <clears throat> and as the sun travels through these star patterns, there's 12 of them. And so you can determine 12 months, not 13, but 12. So and that's in a solar year. And it begins to talk about how to figure that out, why it is, what constellations they start in in the spring and things like that. Things that we already know. A lot of information here. Then in contrast, he's going to explain a lunar month. So a month is actually 30 days on the Essene calendar, uh, should be approximately on the Gregorian calendar. Um, and in the lunar, uh, lunar month, it's actually 29 and a half days. So the way they do a half day is that one month is 30, one month is 29, then 30 and 29, that kind of stuff. Or a lot of people just say it's a 30-day month. So, but this talks about the phases. And if you, if you go by 12 lunar months, you're going to be off 10 days in a year. So that's why in three years, you'd be off 10, 20, 30 days. You'd need a leap month to get back which is the way the modern Jewish calendar does it. So it continues in about the lunar year, how things work. And then when we get to uh, chapter 20, 74, actually, I wanted to start in verse 10 and read some of this. So this tells you basically how they put a year together. So it says, if five years are taken together, the sun is in an excess of 30 days, all of the days for one of those five years. So when they're full, the amount is 364 days. Now, modern Jewish calendar is 354 instead of 364 or 365. And that's why we need a leap month every three days. 
our calendar is 365. It's the most accurate as far as the solstice. The solstice is always on the 19th or 20th of March. 90% of the time, I'd say 95% of the time, it's always March 20th. So you can just use that as a rule of thumb. March 20th, give or take a, a day, which is usually a few minutes into the last day or in the next day, but it's always March 20th. But our, our weeks are off because uh, 52 weeks of seven days each is 364 days. And when you have a 365 day year, then every year that's going to be off. So for instance, th this year, New Year's may have been on a Tuesday. Next year, it might be on a Monday or something like that. One or two days off, depending if it's a normal year or leap year. Uh, a 364 day cycle would always be the same. And no matter how we do this, there, we have to have some sort of a leap system of some sort. And we'll get to that. And this is kind of what he's talking about here. So when you compare this, it says the excess of the sun and the stars amounts to six days. In five years, uh, six days per year comes out to be 30 days. And the moon falls behind the sun and the stars 30 days. And it just goes on. So occasionally we have a 13th month. Whenever you have um, a, a full moon twice in one month, that second full moon is called a blue moon. And it happens once every, not quite a year, but every 13 months. So it goes on and says the sun and the stars bring in all the years exactly. Now, this is an interesting point I wanted to bring out here. Uh, this one here, where it says in verse 12, the sun and the stars. The footnote down here says, or moon. Most of your translations from the Ethiopic are going to say the sun, moon, and stars. And this is what's caused a lot of confusion over the years. How, does the, how, do, how do you use the moon to figure out when you start a leap something? Or do you? What does the moon do? I mean, why do we have it? So on the Gregorian calendar, it's just simply solar. You probably have a calendar on your wall that has the moon phases in it, just because that's kind of important. Uh, some plants and crops do better with moon cycles. Moon cycles control the tides, depending on where you're at, where you're planting, what the animals do with high and low tides. Um, it, hunting might be different. So it's important to know everything, but it has nothing to do with the solar calendar. And in this case, everybody was kind of confused. But when we got the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, again, not all of Enoch was found, or at least the fragments we have. And I'll just let that go for now. But anyway, um, one of the chapters we have is this chapter. And it is word perfect. The numbers are fine and the numbers check out. Except in this place right here, it says the sun and the stars. No mention of the moon. And that helped us to kind of figure out how to do the leap system. So we'll come back to that in a minute. So the sun and the stars bring in the years exactly so that they do not advance or delay their position by a single day throughout eternity. So this is a perpetual calendar. It doesn't have to be corrected every so many years. So it's pretty interesting there. Uh, so it comes in in complete perfect justice, 364 days per year. In three years, there's 1,092 days. And in five years, there's 1,820 days. And in eight years, there's 2,912 days. Now, there's a reason why he mentions uh, three, five, and eight, because it has to go on how they do the leap system. So he's saying if you if you went too short, it would just still be this if you went exactly or if you went too long, it would be this amount. So when you compare this to the moon, you'll be able to know is basically what he's saying. And you don't have to memorize these numbers or anything. It's really simple, the calendar. The moon alone amounts to 1,062 days and five days in five years, rather, it falls 50 days behind the sun. So the sum of these add up to 62 days. And he goes on and talks about other calculations. <clears throat> so then he mentions the four inner calendar days. So here's the way this works. Then you have 12 months that are 30 days each. 
no changing of everything so nobody can figure out anything. A month is 30 days, period. It's always 30 days, never anything else. There's always 12 months, never a 13th month. So that gets confusing. You'd have to figure out, well, what year was this and how did that work and all that kind of stuff. So if there's 12 months of 30 days, that's 360 days. That's why we have a 360 degree circle. Uh, it's why we have a lot of the calculations in the Old Testament are based on 30 days each, um, 360 days in a year, that kind of thing. Uh, but what's going to happen is those are the 30 days inside of each month. But four times a year, we have a solstice or an equinox. Now, an equinox is when the sun is, is just in the right spot where we have exactly 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of nighttime. If they leave the uh, daylight savings time stuff alone, if you just went with regular time. So the summer solstice is when the sun is furthest south. It's the hottest time of the year in the summer. And it's when we have the longest day, more sunlight makes more heat. So in the winter solstice, that's when it's the shortest day of the year, shortest amount of daylight, and it would be the coldest, that'd be the winter. And so that's basically the way this works. So we're trying to figure out when the spring uh, equinox is, that's when the year starts. So in that 360 days inside of 12 months, there's always these days, these four days where it's partially winter, and partially spring. You know, it's that that one day that's not completely winter or spring. It's in between the season. And those are called in Hebrew, tekufa, or they're the solstices and the equinoxes, and they're intercalendary days. So they're not going to be inside of any particular month. Months are always 30 days apiece. But then three every three months, you've got this one single day kind of floating by itself, the way this works. So it goes on and talks about the leaders of the heads of the thousands who are placed over all of creation and over the stars also have to do with the four intercalendary days. Being inseparable from their office, according to the reckoning of the year, these render service on the four days, which are not counted in the reckoning of the year. So they're not counted inside the months. On, account, on their account, men make a mistake of them, uh, for these truly serve on their stations, one in the first constellation, another in a third, another in a fourth, another in a sixth. So it goes on and talks about these. We'll talk more about those constellations and how those figure in a minute. So he goes on and talks about how the archangel Uriel showed him how to calculate the years and how they all come together. So there's one particular thing that I want to show you. From here, we'll go over to... The zodiac and the deacon, the, those are the 12 major constellations. The decans are three constellations around those constellations that work with, you know, calculating time. So it goes on and talks about several of these things, the quarters and all that. When we get down to 78, chapter 78, verse 10 says something really interesting. It says, and I'll get it right here. So it says, and uh, Uriel, who's, who's an angel, showed me another law. When light is added to the moon, on which side it is added to her by the sun, during all the periods of the moon, which is growing in her light, she increases. So in other words, you start out with a new moon, where there's no light, and you see this really small crescent, and then it begins to grow, and eventually there's a full moon. So as it's growing... This law that Uriel is saying, that as it's growing in light, he's saying that the moon itself is not a light. It's like a reflection or a mirror. It's the same thing it says in Genesis, but it's interesting to see this here. So they don't have the idea the sun is a light and the moon is a light. The sun actually gives off its own light. The moon reflects it. And the only reason why we see these crescents or these half moons is the, the shadow of the earth from the sun on the moon. So that's one reason why we can tell that we, you know, are not a flat earth per se. But it's an interesting thing here. So he's telling us that the, the moon's shadow is from the sun and the moon itself is not a big light bulb. It, it's simply reflecting it. So there's a lot of interesting things in here that I thought were kind of, kind of cool. 
But let's go on now and just kind of look at the year in general. And this is a good time for this because I'm giving this at, uh, this is the 11th of, of March. So next, uh, oh, this comes up here, you can see this. Tuesday is when I have my Bible study at my home. Mondays always when we have our study. So next Monday will be the 18th. And then Tuesday the 19th is actually the uh, the spring equinox. So the 20th here is New Year's. So we're coming up on the Dead Sea Scroll New Year for this. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so first, let's look at this. People say, well, the Bible talks about new moons. So why in the world do we say there's a solar calendar? and not a lunar calendar. Well, the word for new moon, there's a specific word for it, new moon and full moon, and it uses the word moon. The scriptures in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, when Paul quotes about the Sabbaths, the new moon festivals, etc., it actually is the word new month instead of new moon. Now, nobody gave it a second thought because if you're on a lunar calendar, the new month is the new moon. So it would be used interchangeably, but technically that's not what the words say. It's new month. And so we're going to go through this and see, in this case, the Bible's not wrong. It's not translated wrong. It's uh, the, the Greek and the Hebrew mean exactly what they say. It's just that we're taught by following rabbinical thought what these things are, and it's become a tradition so to speak. But this is chapter six of the of the book of Jubilees. And again, this is Ethiopic, so some of the numbers may be off, but we can look at this. This is when Noah, uh, after the flood, comes out on the mountain. They begin to, to colonize and plant crops in this. And then there is that covenant, that the Genesis 9 covenant, the blood covenant, the uh, covenant of the rainbow, which is the Noahide covenant. So, and then the rainbow, the Feast of Weeks. And so this is interesting. So they're going to celebrate this. This is when he has his famous dream and the prophetic dream about the mountains and that kind of stuff. Um, and so we get down here, the Noahide calendar. Now I want us to look at this. So this is what it says here for the calendar. Verse 22, it says, I have written, uh, for I have written in the book of the first law, in that which I have written for thee, that you should celebrate it in its season, one day in the year. I have explained the sacrifices that the children of Israel should remember and should celebrate it through the generations of the earth one day every year. So this is Moses writing Jubilees, just like he's writing Genesis, uh, but he is talking about Noah and those kind of things. So he's written in the book of the first law, that would be uh, Leviticus or Deut Deuteronomy second law. So you've got Numbers, Exodus, and Genesis. So here is part of this calendar system. On the new moon of the first month, and of course when we did this, we didn't realize that there was a, a difference in a moon phase. So again, the, moon, the word for new moon, Kodesh, doesn't necessarily mean a new moon. It means a new month. If we're on a, lo a lunar calendar, it'd be the same thing. So we're assuming Jewish calendar, new moon, but it's actually the new moon. So on the, or new month rather. So on the, the, a new month at the beginning, on the first of the month, and on the beginning of a, a month, new moon, new month, on the fourth month. So in other words, the first month, the fourth month, the seventh month, and the tenth month are all days of remembrance. So they're to be marked, okay? And so these are, there. There's a, there's a first day of every month, which the Jews do some rituals on, but every three months you have those first days of remembrance. The day before these are tekufas, or the days that are half spring, half summer, that kind of stuff. So he goes through and it says that um, they're days of remembrance and the days of the seasons in the four divisions of the year. These are written and ordained as a testimony forever. So that's just the way earth time works. There's spring, summer, fall, and winter. And there always will be spring, summer, fall, and winter. You can calculate the Saturn patterns, the moon patterns, any other pattern you want. 
but that's not going to really affect hunting and, and crops and gathering and things like that, the food. So proper time is that way. Um, okay, it says Noah ordained them, these four days, Noah ordained them as feasts for their generations forever. That's why we have a Tuesday night Bible study. And once every quarter, we have a takufa, which is basically we get together and have a potluck. And we remember the commands of Noah. We talk about prophecy. Basically, the way it's supposed to work is you get together and you have a meal, like a Thanksgiving meal. We give thanks for everything God's doing. We focus on, number one, is there sin in anybody's life? Does anybody need repentance? Repentance is really important. Secondarily, are there any prophecies about the Messiah have been fulfilled in the last three months? If so, let's study those. And if there's no repentance needed and there's no prophecies fulfilled, nothing to talk about, uh, then we just have family time. The family did together and has a Thanksgiving type meal and it's a tikufa. So these are the, the festivals or the uh, feasts uh, that are mentioned. So nor or Noah ordained them for himself as feasts forever. They have come thereby a memorial to him. Now we're all sons of Noah. Now I'm not saying it's a sin if you do this or don't do this or anything like that, but it's something ordained by the calendar. You can go live by any kind of calendar you want to, but if you want to understand what God's doing, not that you have to do anything. We don't sacrifice animals. We don't do rituals, uh, that kind of stuff like Passover, Pentecost. It's not part of the Christian faith, uh, but it's good to know about because they mark prophecy. So it's not mandatory that you do anything, but it's good to know about. And so in this case, if it brings you closer to the Lord, reminds you four times a year that do we need to repent? Maybe we don't need to repent. Maybe there's no prophecies, but would the Lord have me do something else? Should I quit my job and start a ministry? Should I quit the ministry I'm in and do something different? Should I move somewhere? What would the Lord have me do? It's always good to think of things like that in your life. What would the Lord want me to do or not do? And is there any sin or could I do something better? Maybe I'm not sinning, but something like that. So it goes on and talks about uh, on the new moon of the first month is when he was bidden to make an ark. On that day, the earth also became dry. And it goes on and talks about on the fourth month, the depths of the abysses were open. You can get this from Genesis. And the seventh month, all of the mouths of the abysses were opened and the waters began to descend. And on the 10th month, the tops of the mountains were seen and Noah was glad. So I put this in here assuming that we're going by the modern Jewish calendar where the uh, year starts in the fall rather than the spring, uh, the first month would be autumn, winter, spring, and summer when these happen. And then I noted down in the footnotes that somehow this seems to be flipped. And I don't know why the author flipped this. Well, the author didn't flip it. If we understand that the first month is actually in the spring, not in the fall, everything rotates six months. It's absolutely perfect. It's not out of order at all. But uh, this is what's interesting. I want us to look at this part here. The calendar gets corrupted in the last days, towards the last days of their time period, not ours. Remember, uh, the way they do this in the Dead Sea Scrolls is that you have a 2,000-year period. The last days are the last two or three or four generations or, or jubilees. 150 years or so, things begin to happen. So we're in the last days of our generation too. When the Antichrist comes, there's a tribulation. But we all know there's another thousand years past that. So it's not that the earth is going to be destroyed in the next seven years. I mean, totally incinerated. That happens when we have a new heavens and a new earth. It's at least a thousand and seven years away. So, but there are last days in each age. And they're talking about first coming. Before the first coming, these things would happen. So it says, if they do neglect and do not observe them according to his commandment, they will disturb all the seasons and the years will be dislodged from the order and they will neglect their ordinances. So think about this. If you were a high priest and you're supposed to go in on Yom Kippur and do a ritual, 
just on that one day. But because of your calendar, you've got it set as last week or next week or something. You're not doing the ritual right. And it's really important we do these things proper, not us, but that they did those things properly, the priests and the high priest. So and that's what they're talking about. If they're not following the right calendar, and there's a whole history of this in the scrolls about the Essenes and the Maccabean period and the things that happen. But it says, so this is a prophecy being given. Uh, so that would happen. All the children of Israel will forget and will not find the path of the years. They will forget the new moons, which are the new months, the seasons, the tekufas, the three-month periods, the Sabbaths, uh, which could be weekly Sabbaths or the festivals, or even like a Shemitah is a seven-year period. It's a week of years. Uh, so, But they'll mess all those up because they won't know how to calculate them. They will go wrong as to all the order of the years. And I will know from henceforth, and I shall declare it to you, not from my own understanding, basically, but the book that lies written before me. Uh, the division of the days is ordained. Least they forget the feasts of the covenant and walk like the feasts of the Gentiles after their own error and after their own ignorance. Therefore, uh, for there will be those who will assuredly make observations of the moon. So they're going to switch from a solar calendar to a lunar calendar. That's going to be one of the errors. And now it disturbs the seasons and comes out from that year 10 days too soon. We saw that in Enoch. If you're going by a lunar month instead of a solar month at the end of the year, you're 10 days short, which is the reason why the modern calendar, modern Jewish calendar in three years, you'd be 30 days short. You need a leap month. So that's what he's saying here. So that's what's going to happen if you switch to a lunar one. So he says, for this reason, the years will come upon them and they will disturb the order. They will make an abominable day, the day of testimony and an unclean day, a day of a feast. They will confound all the days, the holy with the unclean, the unclean day with the holy, and they will go wrong as to the months and the Sabbaths and the feasts and the Jubilees. Now, Jubilee is a 50-year period. So if you keep doing this over centuries, you're going to get way off. And we're going to see what, what the dates look like in a minute. For this reason, I command and testify to you that you may testify to them, after my death, the children, children of Israel will disturb them and they will not make the year. Look at this. The year should be. They will not make the year 364 days only. They actually turn it to 354. They 10 days short because they're going lunar. Uh, so they'll go wrong as to the new moons, the new months, the seasons, the Sabbaths, the festivals and, and do all this other stuff. So this is a prophecy out of Jubilees that somewhere along the line, they pervert this. Now, we know this happened during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, when they tried to get rid of all the Jewish ceremonies, the uh, reading of Torah, the circumcision, all the different rites, they replaced the money, uh, the, the calendar, everything. And when Antiochus Epiphanes died, the new guy that took the throne simply said, I don't care about religion, I just want money. So here's the deal. Go back to worshiping whatever you want, whenever you want, whatever. I just want money. I want it in my form of money. So you take your grain and sell it and get my coins and then give me the, you know, the coins and you do it according to my calendar. So they're supposed to adopt their money, their calendar system, and then anything else they want to do is fine. And the Maccabees decided this is a win-win situation. We've got everything back. The Essenes said, no, this is the prophecy. This is when you err according to the calendar. You can't do that. And the persecution began from the Hasmoneans on the Essenes. So a whole other set of history there. But let's look how, on how this works. So here is uh, uh, the calendar in a nutshell here. So we start with spring. And there's, again, three months in the spring, 30 days each. Okay. And then there is this, this vernal equinox or spring equinox. This is the one day in between winter and spring. And then there's one day that's half spring, half summer. That's the summer solstice day or that takufa. One day. 
So in other words, the next day is the first full day of summer. This is the first full day of spring. And it goes on this way. So there's three days of summer. So this is uh, early spring, mid spring, and late spring. And then early summer, mid summer, late summer. And then there's another one, the autumn uh, or the fall equinox. And that's one day. And then there's uh, early fall, middle fall, and late fall, the three months. And then there's the one day that's the winter solstice we talked about. And then the first full day of winter starts. And you've got uh, um, early winter, midwinter, and late winter. And then the year starts off again. So these are the four seasons, spring, summer, autumn, or fall, and winter. Enoch calendar is 364 days. So again, 12, 12 months of 30 days each, that's 360 days, one day outside the calendar months for each of the four solstices and equinoxes, or the tekufas, 364, which is divisible by seven evenly. So that is really cool. Let's go to our next chart here and I'll show you another thing. So this is um, one that's in our calendar book. Same kind of stuff, spring, summer, fall, and winter. You got three months of 30 each, but now here are the weeks and they're kind of cut off in the midst, but you've got the first 13 weeks, another 13 weeks, 13 weeks, and 13 weeks. And as you can see, it's 52 weeks. 52 times seven is 364. So the year is always perfect. So if you were to ask, when is New Year's? It's Nisan 1, which is Wednesday. When is Passover? It's Nisan 14, it's a Tuesday. What will it be next year? Tuesday. What was Passover last year? Tuesday. It's always Tuesday, always the same. Just like Sabbath is always Friday night and Saturday. It's, it's always the same. So it's based on the weekly cycle, the, the seven day cycle, not the yearly one. So that's kind of how that works. Now, this is interesting. Here's a, uh, here's a picture of our recreated um, one on the DSS calendar website. You can kind of see the same thing. So here are the Takufas. So these are on a Tuesday. So it starts on Sunday and goes to the end of the week. And each one of these are weeks. So it starts on a Tuesday. So New Year's would be right here. That's Wednesday. And so you're going to have 30 days of Nisan, 30 days of ER, 30 days of Savan. And then you have a Takufa, which is just, at that point, it's the summer solstice between the months. And it goes on down this way. And so this is the the spring uh, equinox, summer solstice, fall equinox, and this is the winter solstice during the month of during the week of Hanukkah, and then back again. And then these are always on a Sunday, and these are the mid seasonal ones. So, for instance, this is mid spring, according to Genesis. That's the date of, of uh, the destruction of the world by the flood. We commemorate it once we flipped the calendar and made it uh, lunar and then flipped it over here, which is the full moon of October. So it's Halloween. So that's how you know, the origins come about, the calendar getting flipped. So let me show you one other thing, though. This is kind of interesting. This is a picture of, it's a replica, and I have this at home. If you ever see me at the conferences or whatever, I usually show this, but this is a Dead Sea Scroll calendar uh, or sundial actually. And it has several functions. We won't get into it today, but it tells you the months and the weeks and the, the uh, solstices and equinoxes and things like that. So it's a really interesting calendar. This is a copy of one that was found at the entrance of Qumran. So since it's at the entrance, uh, sitting on a ledge, we know it was something that was in use. So this is an example of an actual Dead Sea sundial. So fascinating. This helped us figure out how the months and everything worked also. Here is, a, I think it's an Aztec uh, thing. And basically, this is an idea of, remember in Enoch, when it talked about the, uh, the gates or the constellations and when the sun would come up. So what they've done here is that it's, it's so many feet back, depending on how large it is, so many feet back, and you'll see these um, basically six or more poles. And from the same vantage point, you're, we're looking east, 
when it comes up, here's November 18th and this the summer solstice or winter solstice rather in December. And it's it's opposite down there because we're South America. But uh, each one of these is a month and, and you can go through and see. So April, May and then June. OK, summer solstice for us, winter for them. And it starts going back. So if you observe this over the years, you would actually go out at six o'clock in the morning or sunrise every single day. And you will notice the sun comes up slightly different each time. In a month's time, it's going to be off one of these things. So it's a fascinating thing. You can do this at home. There are sundials, different things you can set up. There are all these Stonehenge type places that are large calendars that do the same kind of thing and calculate other things too. Let me show you another example of one. I think this is a little bit better. This is one, I'm not sure where that's at. Uh, Peru, this is in Peru. This is the same thing from the same vantage point. And there's the equinox, the next month, the fifth month, sixth month is a solstice. Starts going back the other way, seven, eight, ninth month is an equinox, 10th, 11th, and then 12th, which is a solstice. So you would see this pattern repeated every year. What's interesting about this one, notice it's going every two mountains or two hills, whatever it is, for a month. So if you were to look and go from tip to tip, that would be a two-week period. If you would go from tip to point or, or valley, and then mountaintop to valley, mountaintop to valley, you would actually be looking at the weeks. So you could start, say, like on Sunday, and if Sunday was right here, next sunday would be right here and then next sunday and next sunday and next sunday and next sunday going down like this as you can see so it's fascinating if you have enough of them you can back it up this one you could actually use to calculate sabbaths or weeks now if you could back it up a little more and have a little more detail to it and break it up into seven more pieces you could count the days and there are actually calendars that do this in different places. Fascinating to look at. Okay, so let me go here. This is our, let me refresh this, this is our um, DSS calendar site. So to understand this, so today, and this is March 12, 2024, and it's Tuesday at two o'clock in the morning, Israeli Standard Time. This is from Israel, so it's already tomorrow. Right now it's Monday night, my time, but it's Tuesday. So for Tuesday, March 12th, 2024, the uh, Pharisee date or the modern Jewish calendar date is Adar 2, the, the second month. So it's in that 13th month, the second Adar. Uh, so this is a leap month cycle for them. So it's the second of second Adar in the year 5784. According to the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, it's Adar 24. There's only one. So uh, 24 to 2 is kind of interesting. But notice the years, 5784 to 5948. It's 160-some years difference. Remember, that's what the prophecy was. If you start messing with the lunar calendar, you're going to get off not only in the... You're not going to do Passover, Pentecost, and the rituals, right? But you're going to get off by months and seasons and eventually get off. And there is an entire history we have from the Seder Olam and other things that tell us how the, the dates got off, the numbers, and then the other things. So it's really interesting to kind of see. But this gives us that. And here's a playlist of other Dead Sea Scrolls if, on YouTube if you're interested. But let me give to you, let's go to 2024. So here's 2024, which is the year 5949. So this begins a the last year of a seven-year Shemitah cycle. So this is a Shemitah year, uh, and that has some things, you know, prophetically to look at. This is interesting because next year is actually a Jubilee year, so a 50-year count. Some people get confused and say a Jubilee is 49 years. So two Jubilees is actually 98 years instead of 50. And I think that comes from the Book of Jubilees, the Ethiopian edition, because it kind of says that. And that's confused a lot of people. This stuff was changed and then promptly forgotten for centuries. And then the Book of Enoch, Book of Jubilees, and other things from the Ethiopian canon came 
and we try to recreate them, get a better understanding, but not quite right. Then the Dead Sea Scrolls come along and give us the rest of the story. So that's what's really nice to have it. So here we have, same thing again, the first is that day of remembrance that Noah com commemorated. So that's uh, March 20th, it's a Wednesday. That's the first day of the new year. The day before it is that half day, half winter, half spring. So it's a Tekufa, so Tekufa Nisan. And I'm just using these modern Jewish names for the months because we don't know what the old ones were. For Nisan, it was called Aviv or Abib. Uh, the others, we don't, we know, we know uh, Zif, Bol, Aviv, and Ethnon. The other, that's four, but the rest of them, we don't know what their names were. And it doesn't really matter. But so here is the, the spring equinox and then the first day. And as you can see, it's Passover and unleavened bread, first fruits, 50 days later, there's mid spring. So there's the anniversary of the real flood. Uh, but 50 days after first fruits is Pentecost. 50 days after Pentecost is first fruits of new wine, which is the um, grapes. And then 50 days after new wine is the first fruits of new oil, which is the olive crop. And then uh, after that, the very next day is the wood offering for the temple for the year. When that's done, just a couple of days later is the fall day of remembrance, which is the uh, festival of trumpets. So you've got trumpets, day of atonement, and then tabernacles. So really interesting ways of doing this. But you'll notice every year then we have it start on a Wednesday. So we were saying about how the leap system works. So we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, we don't have a leap day. And we know that the lunar cycle or going by the months was prophesied as an error. So the only other thing we have is a leap week. And that would keep the, the Sabbaths in the cycle. And for them, the Sabbath and the seven day cycle is the most important. So you can see now where if someone said it was Passover and after they had their Passover meal, three days later, something happened. One two, three. Well, if it was at nighttime, it must be Friday night. It was the beginning of the Sabbath. So you'd instantly know things about what's going on by knowing that kind of thing. Um, so for instance, here is, uh, at, remember Genesis says that it was the 17th of the second month when the flood came. So here's the first month, here's the second month, and the 17th day of that is a Sunday, and it is mid-spring on their calendar. So that's pretty interesting. The flood occurred at that particular point. So I'm not sure what that means prophetically, if it does have a meaning, but I think it is kind of important for us to, to know. The very least, when we can mark things on the calendar, it was 4,000 and some years ago today, you know, that this event occurred. It was a real event. It actually occurred. And we've got it marked on the calendar. So <clears throat> you can come here and look at these things. So, for instance, if we go back to here, this one here, um, in here you can actually put in a date. So, I've got 23, 24, and 25, and you can put in, like, I was born in 1965, so a four-digit year from 1900 to 2100. So, if we put in 2025... Uh, here be 2025, and as you can see, it's 5950. So that actually is the Jewish year, or Jew, uh, the Jubilee year. Okay, so if we go to 2526, for instance, that would be 5951. That is the first year of the last Jubilee, according to their calendar. And Jubilees are usually called generations. So in some sense, at least, this is the first year of that last generation of our age in which a lot of prophecies are supposed to occur. Now, Jesus may not have been referring to this when he said the last generation, but he may have been. So it's important to understand the calendar. There's a lot of things in the calendar that point to prophecy. So I'm just saying. Um, let's see here. So I think, I think that's it for our study. Um, but I will hop back to, let's see here. So Jubilees, I think this one, that's the basic understanding of our calendar. So 
the years end up being um, off by 160, but it's really easy to tell. One of my favorite Dead Sea Scrolls is 11Q13, and it talks about the Messiah, who is the Melchizedekian priest, who is God incarnate, dies for our sins. Doesn't say dies, but he the, he does a certain thing that forgives our iniquities and reconciles us to God. Okay, and other scrolls talk about his death reconciles us to God. So it's the same thing. But in this particular scroll, it says that event where the Messiah reconciles us to God occurs one Shemitah after the end of the ninth Jubilee. As a matter of fact, let me go back to the uh, Dead Sea Scroll calendar and we'll look at our, our Una studies. I meant to mention that too. See, an Una is a 500 year period. There's five, four of them per age. And each one of us made up of 50, of 10 rather, Jubilees, which are 10 50 year periods. So if we go to, I think it's the fourth one, which, or no, eighth, is the time Jesus would have been here. So it's the eighth one. And we go down here, and you can see the calendar is basically in Jubilee cycles. So here's the seventh Jubilee, the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth. So if it's the uh, end of the ninth Jubilee, the starting of the 10th, and we're exactly one Shemitah into it, one seven-year period. It ends in 25. 25 plus seven is 32. So uh, years 26 to 32 are that first seven-year period. And so Jesus is supposed to have died uh, at the end of that seven-year period, where the Messiah, who is God incarnate, pays the penalty for our sin nature, whatever that is is what the scroll actually says. One Shemitah after the end of the ninth Jubilee of that Una. So it's really interesting to see this. So again, we understand if it's the eighth Una of the second age, you're in the 2000, two to 4,000 year period. You're almost done. It's almost up to the year 4,000. You're in that last 50 year period and you're seven years into it. So that's going to be for us 32 AD. Uh, but for their calendar, it was the year 3957. So it's really, when you have two or three of these things plugged together, they really begin to explain things. And that's how we know for sure what today is. So uh, that's why I tell everybody, I could be totally wrong on this, but it, to, in my mind, I don't see a whole lot happening this year or even next year. It's a jubilee year, might even be some sort of revival or something. But the following year, when we start the very last Jubilee period or the very last age, that's when I see a lot of prophecies happening, not necessarily in 26, but in that time period. And that doesn't mean we have to wait to the end of that time period to see a rapture, resurrection, Antichrist or whatever. Those are not connected necessarily. They may be, but... These are the things that we want to look for and see patterns. So it's really, really important. That's why we created this site for you guys to use. You can come and look up all the owners, get used to having a different system. When I look these up in ADBC, which is these, or even the AM system, sometimes I see patterns. Sometimes I see nothing as a random number. But when you start looking at sets of seven with, with Jubilees, all of a sudden you see patterns. So it's really, really interesting for that. So let me go at this point, we'll stop and I'll go back to the chat room and see if there's any questions. And looks like we have quite a few. Let's see here. First question, $10 donation. Thank you very much. Uh, is Goliath the Philistine of Gath, which is recorded in 2 Samuel, the same person as Goliath the Gittite uh, in Chronicles. Thanks for sharing. I believe it is because they were both in the same area. They were both giants. They were both part of a giant family. Gittite could be different, but it's also a, a different, um, a different um, way of saying it. They had several dialects at the time. And of course, this may not be Hebrew. It's whatever language the Philistines did. Uh, so uh, I, but I would believe it is. There are some people that might say it's different. But it would be really odd to have two different cities really close together, two giant families, and you know, in that sense. So I uh, hope that helps. 
question. You mentioned in a video there is a manuscript that says Canaan found writings at Mount Hermon about genealogy. Could this possibly be an explanation for Satan being released after the millennium? I'm not sure how that would be connected. I'd have to try to figure that out. But yeah, there is a manuscript like that. Right now, we're just doing Enoch. So we will finish Enoch with the calendar and stuff like that. Later on, we'll create a, a playlist and go through and we'll have a, a series on post-flood Nephilim. That'll get really interesting. But we need to know who we're dealing with, who the demons are, what the history was. And so that's why we're doing Enoch, plus the prophecies in Enoch. When we get toward the end of the book, those are phenomenal. Again, and we can plug some of those into our calendar. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why they would be connected. It's, it's a possibility, but I'd have to look at that. Any chance you would add mentioned Bible days to your DSS calendar, like the day mentioned in Genesis 11? The day the flood, that would be neat. Yeah, I would like to do that. I mean, we already have had some of that stuff. Um, let's see here. So like here is mid-spring, so that's the date. But yeah, right here, if, if we, it it's designed for that to have those kind of things in here. I don't think I have anything other than, yeah, you could put in 4th of July and all that kind of stuff too. Yeah, it's designed for that. I just don't have it. One of the things that I'm trying to do is uh, let me exit out of this, go back to here. Um, let's see, let's do this. Um, you know, these are the honest studies. But one of the other things we were trying to do is we've got an Enoch calendar, which is a, a set of prophecies we haven't got to yet. Um, but then there's outer and inner rings that, and the, these pages explain how they work. So here are the days of the outer rings what they mean, the, the equinoxes. So here, I should have used this before, but here's the midsummer and mid-springs, and they'll kind of interactive there, and they tell you about them. But then we also have the inner rings, which tells us about the years. So it's like the the four ages on, on the patterns, the week, the uh, 14 onas, and the ages they are, and on down like that. And we had one we wanted to create, and I'll just go ahead and show it to you. And I, I did all of this in PHP and HTML, but somehow some months work great and other months I get this. <laughs> so it's just my coding. There's some little bitty thing in there I need to fix, but this would have the outer ring and the inner rings. And right here, it should tell you the Jubilee system. So like the year, the Shemitah, the Jubilee, the Ana, and the age, and then the AM date and the Gregorian date and the week with day of the week and stuff like that. So that'll be a really cool thing to do if we can ever get get it down to that part. But yeah, that would be good to add. Now, uh, the we do have that in the ONA studies. So when you go to the 500-year period, not the day of the week or the day the day of an event happened in a in a in a year cycle, but the years anyway. So the ONA studies would tell you when things happen in the year. Rarely do we have anything that says it was a certain day. Um, like, uh, well, one of the things, the, the wedding at Canaan, when Jesus um, changed the water to wine, all it says is that it was the third day. And, you know, you know that's important, but to us over here in the West, it's like that does not mean anything to me at all. Well, it should if you knew the calendar, most weddings happen on uh, the festival of new wine, which is the third of Av. So when it says that Jesus went to a wedding in Canaan and it was on the third day of the month, obviously Av, that's new wine. And then something happened with the wine and he changed the water to wine. You instantly know what's going on. Now, we don't know much about the rest of the ritual for the festival of new wine. If we did, we'd probably know exactly why he did what he did. It would be really obvious, just like when you do a Passover Seder, and it's really obvious the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah, and then the Enoch and the second coming and all that stuff being in there. So yeah, we're working on that. We would like to do that kind of stuff. I think it would be a lot of fun. We're, we're beginning to, to have enough income to expand the ministry 
So we're going to be probably hiring um, another person, and hopefully that'll be my son. But um, uh, he's good with graphics and things like that, and I'm actually pretty good with this kind of stuff. So we'll be able to start doing more projects, more graphics, more books. I would like to do um, another, well, I've got some of the graphics for the prophecies on the website that I've shown you guys in the past. I'd like to do some more of those. I eventually a picture book on prophecy, all the charts and everything, kind of like what Clarence Larkin did. So there's a lot of projects we would like to do. It's just taking us a while. But we would get there. And that's one of them. I would like to really expand that and get my my glitch fixed. You know, however I did that. It's funny because some months it works absolutely perfect. Other months it does that. So anyway, um, let's see here. Do you know why the book of wisdom was removed since it was quoted so often by the early churches? Um, well, first off, the way that it works, according to the scrolls, the Ezra apocalypse and others, is that the Old Testament is supposed to be uh, our 39 books. Now, they count them a little differently than we do, but it's the same set. And so the canon is supposed to be closed and nothing's supposed to be added to it. So wisdom, even though it would have been written by Solomon or the friends of Solomon back in Solomon's day, and, and it is a pretty interesting book as far as wisdom goes. Uh, I like wisdom. I like Ecclesiasticus or Sirach, uh, some of those other wisdom books out of the, the intertestamental period. Fantastic to study. Um, but they're just not, for whatever reason, supposed to be added to the canon. We'll see this in the book of Enoch. There's a place in here where he says, that they will be there will be a series or a set of books that the righteous live their life by and that's our canon and he says that his book is specifically not to be added to that group his is to be kept separate so those of us that want to study prophecy are supposed to go to the rest of the library it's kind of like a library if you think about it nobody is going to try in their lifetime to read every single book in the entire library that's not what it's for. It's like if you want to know auto mechanics, you want to know history, you go look up whatever it is you're wanting to know, and hopefully there's a record about it. And so the same kind of thing. So we have all these extra biblical records that can be very important, but they really don't need to be studied as far as a life of godliness and salvation. Like Peter would say, you have everything you need to know for a life of godliness and salvation. But if you're curious like me, I want to know the rest of the stuff. So I would say it's it's not removed per se, but it is part of that other the intermittent testimonial canon. And the Greeks, uh, for whatever reason, started adding or putting some of these things in their canon. So it really shouldn't be in there. But there's nothing wrong with it that I know of, or some copies may be garbled by now. A lot of stuff that's even really old like that that may be in certain manuscripts if they're not preserved in the vast amount of Bibles, can get garbled. So it may have uh, problems with it, but those would be typos, though, scribal errors. So as far as I know, there's no specific reason why it shouldn't be read. It's just not supposed to be a part of that. It'd be equally weird if you tried to put it in the New Testament. If you were going to put it in the Bible, it should be in the Old Testament around Solomon's time. You know, so it's that kind of a thing. I have a question regarding the book of Enoch. I think it mentions Nephilim being killed by the sword. Oh, yeah, okay. If the flood killed them, is this referring to a Nephilim that came back later? No, it would be, this is all pre-flood. Pre so it's talking about uh, the, the sending a, a sword between people is an idiom, meaning to cause a civil war or cause a, a problem. If I, if I could anger you enough and say your neighbor did this horrible thing to you and then go tell your neighbor that you did this horrible thing to them, I might get you guys to kill each other, You're putting you together. And that would be, if I even tried to do something like that, that would be putting a sword between you two. It doesn't necessarily mean you used a sword. You'd probably use a gun or something else. But uh, it's kind of an idiom. So a sword was put between the, the, the rival clans. And the, the text of Enoch, you can go back and look at our previous studies. We started our Enoch studies at the beginning of the year. 
And so in them, we talked about how there was a civil war between three giant clans. And they were basically allowed to kill each other off. And so that's what happened. We see the same thing through the Old Testament where people try to attack Israel. God sends confusion to them. And they think that one set of their army, each side thinks the other side is Israel. And so they attack each other and destroy themselves. We see that uh, as part of the war that happens with Ezekiel 38. Somebody, you know, glitches on purpose. The Lord sends confusion to them and that happens. But yeah, we'll get to the post-flood stuff eventually. In a previous video, you mentioned something in the Assumption of Moses. Do you think that's a fairly reliable document? I haven't looked at it a whole lot. I remember reading it in seminary. Uh, the main thing I was looking for is we've got a couple of church fathers that tell us that is the book that Jude is quoting when he's talking about Satan and, and Michael the Archangel basically arguing over the body of Moses. Uh, so we're told that, but the current version of the Assumption of Moses has a general history of the life of Moses, but it ends right after his death. So in the version we have, I'm assuming the church fathers are correct, but in the version we have, that part of the story is not there. So unless there's another version, maybe what I read is a fake medieval version. That's a possibility too. But the old ones knew about it, that it was a quote on something, but I don't know really what the real one is. I, and as far as I can tell, nobody's found the exact quote in any manuscript. So I wish they would, though. That's a good question. Why does Enoch refer to Hebrews when there aren't any yet? Uh, it's, it's the rewrite. It's been rewritten multiple times throughout the ages. Plus, this particular version, this is the only full version we have. It comes from the Ethiopian Bible. So the Hebrew, which would have been written rewritten through the centuries with at least place names, so the descendants of, of uh, Abraham are Hebrews. Uh, like it talks about Persia, Persia going to war with Israel. Uh, if I was to rewrite it again, put it in modern English, uh, I might change that to Iran. Now, Iran didn't exist before 1939, I think it is. It was just called Persia. But you can tell the time when people rewrite stuff like that. <clears throat> which helps a lot. I mean, that's why we have modern English Bibles that kind of rewrite everything to put it in, in modern English terms. Hopefully they don't garble the message. But yeah, you'll see that kind of thing. But even at that, though, the Hebrew version, which is what we have fragments of in the Dead Sea Scrolls, was taken and copied into Giez, which is a very, very ancient form of Ethiopian language. And then Giez is translated or, you know, becomes uh, uh, Amoric. And then R.H. Charles, a couple of hundred years ago, translated that into English. So you've got Hebrew to Giez to Aramic to English. And so when you do that kind of stuff, things get garbled. And hopefully they know for sure what they're talking about, and then they change the place names. So that's all we're talking about. Yeah, we mentioned that in a, two or three studies back, because he mentions that he went down to Dan, tell Dan. That shouldn't have been there, I don't think. It's possible there could have been a Dan there, a city, and the tribe of Dan was named after it or something like that. But most likely it's just whatever that area was called. By the time the rewrite happened several centuries later, they just said this is currently called the area of Dan. So that's a good question. Okay, Super Chat, $20. Thank you very much for the donations. We appreciate everything you do uh, donating through here. <clears throat> give send go and paypal and, and buying the books to help support the ministry matthew 24 29 alludes possibly to a solar eclipse i was curious if any dead sea scrolls refer to an eclipse and a prophetic reference not that i know of per se i mean they talk about the calendar and even all this calendar section it has a bearing on prophecy because if we get our calendar right we can figure out when things happen but other than just knowing the calendar structure, there's no prophecy in the calendar part other than the one prophecy about they're going to garble the calendar at one point. So not that I know of. 
in reference to the calendar for the seven year tribulation, would or wouldn't it make sense for something to happen on the first day of the first Shemitah year leading to the Jubilee year? Yes. Yeah, that, that's my opinion. Uh, also, um, the thing that I wonder about, I'm not afraid to set not an exact date, but even a time frame like that. But I don't know if they use it by saying, uh, you know, I turned five and then a Shemitah later this happened. I don't know if they do it like that because it I'd have to be seven to get into the next Shemitah on the calendar per se. But if they would just add to stuff like that. So for instance, today you could say from 1917, the Balfour Declaration to 19 to 2017 has been two Jubilee periods. It's a full hundred years. Yeah, but it's it's not it that exact those that's not when Jubilees start. 2017 or 1917 or whatever. So would they have said it that way? And if so, then Daniel could just be a set of seven years. Like I, I could say the same thing as uh, I'm going to do something today and then maybe get a um, license from the FCC to transmit or whatever. And those last an entire decade. So 10 years from now, I'll have to get a new one. If I got one today or next year or the following year, whenever it is, it's 10 years. Um, so I don't know if they would use it that way or not, but it's logical to look for that. So you would assume the end of the age is the Jubilee we're talking about, because that's what happened in the first century. It says that uh, the first Shemitah after the end of the ninth Jubilee. So it's, uh, it's all in that last generation. And in that last generation, which is 25 to 75 AD, you have Jesus coming, doing his ministry, being crucified, resurrecting, starting the church, the AIDS of grace, day of Pentecost, the era, uh, preaching of Paul and Peter and the guys, destruction of the Jerusalem temple, shutdown of the Essene temple, then the council of Yavne, and you know all of that in that time period. So very fascinating. So in the last three Jubilees of this age, we have seen like the Balfour Declaration, Israel come back, Israel taking back the Temple Mount. We've seen the rebirth of the Sanhedrin, the rebirth of the language of Israel, taking back of certain cities. And now it looks like the Gaza War prophesied by Amos and Obadiah and Zephaniah uh, coming to pass along with probably the Hezbollah portions of Obadiah and the others. So very fascinating. Those things are actually, we've waited centuries for them to happen. And so now they're finally beginning to. But yeah, I would probably guess that's the correct. It's just like when Jesus came and died on Passover. So if Passover is a figure of his death, burial, and resurrection, and he came and actually died on Passover, and the fall festivals are pictures of the rapture, tribulation, second coming, why wouldn't they occur on those days? So maybe, maybe not, but it's something to definitely be aware of and look for. Uh, do you or can happen to know, talking about my wife, uh, of any churches in the Tulsa area that are end times prophecy friendly churches or decent in general? What I would do is go to um and let me let me just pull one up here if we go to uh, our site biblefacts.org we have a calvary chapel church finder i'd recommend calvary chapels if there are any so if we put in uh 50 miles from tulsa let's try that See if that gives us okay so yeah from in the 50 mile radius it looks like there's three of them Calvary Chapel, Tulsa. Make sure we're in Oklahoma. We are in Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, Maranatha Fellowship in Oswo, Oklahoma. Calvary Chapel, Bartsville. So it looks like there's three yeah, within 50 miles. And you can go up here and change it. Instead of 50 miles, let's try 10 miles. So in within 10 miles, there's one. Calvary Chapel, Tulsa. So... 
It's a long ways for me, but then it gives the phone number and the website so you can check them out and everything. This is a wonderful site. If any of you guys want to do a Cal go to a Calvary Chapel or visit one, if you're coming around or whatever, see if you put in like Olathe, Kansas, we should have Calvary Chapel, Johnson County. That's the one that I go to. And so we have another one close by Calvary Chapel, Kansas City. So a great place and phone numbers, email addresses, websites, uh, addresses to get there, phone numbers. So all that kind of stuff. So that's uh, one of the best place to do. I would go there and check it out. So that one sounds good. Now, that's not to say that every Calvary Chapel is good. There's There's always good and bad churches, but I would definitely go there first to look up stuff. How do you get the question answered by the Lord on what he wants you to do? Um, if the Lord really wants you to do something, he'll make it clear and make your path you know, available to do it. Um, sometimes he wants us to do something, but it's going to take a long time before it actually happens. Uh, like a lot of times... Um, a teenager might think he wants to be a pastor, wants to do this, but that's going to take time. You have to go through different things. So it's mainly done by prayer and looking at what's available and then stepping out in faith. And if you like, if you think, does he want me to go get a job here or go get a job there? Uh, think about it, pray about it, uh, pick one. And he can open or close the door. You'd have to go apply, for instance, for the job. But if he makes it absolutely impossible for you to do this one, then he's closed the door for it. So that's basically what I would say in that case. It's a good question. I've heard a few recordings of Chuck Missler saying everyone used a 360-day calendar until 701 BC when something happened to make everyone change. Is that correct? I don't know. I've heard him and other people say that. Unless I'm misunderstanding the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they s seem to indicate that it's always been the way that is. So if, for instance, the Book of Enoch, the Ethiopic version we have, like we just read, it's a 364-day year. Uh, if that's correct, then pre-flood, they had a 364-day year, if that's correct. And it seems like it is. The Dead Sea Scrolls corroborate the Ethiopic version. So, um, yeah, I don't know about... Uh, there's a lot of things that supposedly happen around 700 BC uh, with a lot of problems uh, corrupting calendars. So I don't know how that works. But Chuck says one thing. The Dead Sea Scrolls seem to say the, the opposite. So it's something to keep in mind. I thought Jesus resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. That doesn't seem possible on the Dead Sea Scroll calendars. What am I missing? Let me uh, go back here to, okay. Okay, on this one, let me just go back to this year, 24. Okay, anyway, uh, same basic idea. What this is, is it's uh, it depends on who you're listening to. There was a, a Sadducee, Pharisee, and Essene way of interpreting the law. The law says that on the first fruits occurs on the day after the Sabbath. And so the Sadducees say, okay, the 15th is a high Sabbath. So it's, it's a holy day that you don't work. So if we're talking about that one, their first fruit festivals would be Thursday of that same week. Pharisees said, no, we're talking about a high Sabbath, the festival itself. So it's the festival, it's the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath after Passover. So that would put it here on this one, the day after the Sabbath of Passover week. The Essenes said it's the weekly uh, Sabbath, you know, agreeing that part of it with the Pharisees, but it's not after Passover, it's after Passover week. So Passover week goes for one full week. So the weekly Sabbath is not here, but here. So the Sadducee first fruits is here on the 14th on Thursday. The Pharisee one is here 
and the Dead Sea Scroll one or a seen one is here. So Jesus, uh, it, you know, Paul does say he's our first fruits. So he's fulfilling all of these festivals. Uh, uh, so that confused me for a while because everything seems to be perfect except for that. Uh, but I, there's more to, to be studied there. I don't understand the whole thing, but there's got to be some sort of prophecy there because I've seen several things that look like a problem that end up being fixed when you plug the calendar into it. For instance, Jesus uh, was supposed to be in the grave for three days and three nights. But if he died on Good Friday, which is a, a Sabbath, uh, there's no way three days and three nights fits into a day and a half. Um, and so everyone realized that it's preparation day is what it says in scripture. So it's the high Sabbath. So basically he has his Passover dinner with his disciples Tuesday night, and then he's crucified Wednesday morning and put in an airtight tomb before the 15th, which is a high Sabbath. So he's in the grave then Wednesday night and Thursday, that's one Thursday night and Friday, that's two. And then Friday night and Saturday, that's three. So sometime after sundown on Saturday, he resurrects. And then you see in the account, Sunday morning, early, right at dawn, the ladies go to the tomb and the stone's already rolled away and he's resurrected. So the Passover week or Passion Week actually fits perfectly in here with this. So really important. But yeah, that's... Uh, so, and then they also taught us that uh, first fruits fifth plus 50 days is Pentecost. And then Pentecost plus 50 days is first fruits of new wine. And then first fruits of new wine plus 50 days is first fruits of new oil. So really important for that. Those all are prophetic. We just, I don't know the full ramifications of them yet. I hope we get more scrolls that really explain everything. Super Chat, $5. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the great teaching. Your book, The Gnostic Origins of Roman Catholicism, has enriched my life tremendously. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, thank you. Anyone knows what year the flood started on? Um, yes, it was 1656. So you can get that from Genesis, uh, Seder, from Jasher, and a few other things. Sorry, I didn't mention that. So, and you can do this actually in Genesis by adding them up. Uh, Adam was created, and when he was 130, Seth was born. And you can just go on down the road and get to Noah. And when Noah was in his 600th year, then on the, sec the 17th day of the second month of that year is when that occurred. So it was 1,656 years, one month and 17 days. And if we go back to our calendar, actually, let me go back to here. So this one, this one. Okay, let me just do it this way. I'll get rid of that first. There we go. If we go to uh, the ONA studies and we go down to, that would be the third ONA. So this is between, okay, it'd be the fourth one because it was in the 1600s. So we'll go to the fourth one here. Uh, I should know that. So if you go down here, this has got Sela Eber being born, Peleg. So here's the flood. So it was, uh, it's in the first Shemitah of the fourth Jubilee of that first age. And it was the year uh, 1656. So 1,656 years after creation. So if we plug this in right, like Messiah dying one Shemitah after the end of the ninth Jubilee, uh, then that means that would have occurred at 2270 BC. So we've, that's one of the things we're trying to do with all of these to kind of pull, pull all that together. The, and then Methuselah died at the, at the age of 969, which was the same year of the flood. Uh, the three sons marrying the three daughters, Lamech dying, stuff like that. Noah marries Nema, 1544 AM, 2372 BC. So we're trying to put all that stuff in here and give it an ADBC date and also an AM date and then show it from this calendar. So we want to use all three calendars in here and hopefully that will get us to understand some of the prophecies. So 1656 from creation. 
what I meant about the question with Canaan and Mount Hermon, could someone possibly find manuscripts to summon him after the millennium? Oh, okay. Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, that's always a possibility. Uh, but the, the manuscripts, as far as I know of, all the stuff that we have from that stuff, and we have the Book of Giants from the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's all about the genetic tampering. So it's how to create an unstable life form and mix species together is the main thing like that. Um, I've always looked at it as like at a certain time, the Lord releases, like in Revelation, the nine tenths of the demons that are chained up in um, the ninth um, seal or trumpet or vial or whatever, where the demon locusts come out. Um, it says that the, the, an angel was given a key and came down and opened it. So that sounds to me like the Lord saying, okay, now is the time. So rather than us, Lord, like the four under the Euphrates, I just assume the Lord would at a certain point release them rather than us, you know, digging in the wrong spot and breaking something and releasing them. I don't think we could actually do something like that, but I could be wrong. That's a good point. Um, let's see. I suspected the red heifers were genetically modified. Ooh, okay. Man's attempt to get it done. Pastor from Florida said that on uh, Horn's Sun Show. Tom, yeah, that'd be uh, Joe Horn. Recently, that confirmed that they were. What are your thoughts? That's a good question. Um, I guess it depends on what they did or how they're genetically modified. They're they're crossbred over and over and over again so that they're completely red. They're not supposed to have a single hair that's white or black. And they have to be to be sacrificed. They have to be uh, so many years old and not over so many years. And there's a whole bunch of things like that. <clears throat> so that's that's a good question. I don't know. There's been a lot of genetic problems. Like, for instance, most milk we have from our cows is called A2. There's a genetic change that happened, I don't know, a thousand years ago or so. Natural change, but still it's genetic change. And some people have problems like lactose intolerance. It's slightly different, but problems with A1, which is normal milk. There's A2 milk now. And a lot of people that have those problems can drink A2 milk and not have a problem with it. So it just shows that things change. It's interesting that 90% of our milk is A1, though. But, um, yeah, I don't know what to make of that exactly. It's We know that it will happen, and that looks like what's going on, so we'll have to, to see exactly what does happen. And I didn't know about that, so I'll have to check into it. Have you heard the report about David burying Goliath's head in the spot called Golgotha? I have heard people talk about it. I don't know that there's any evidence for it, though. That would be interesting. I'd also heard a report that it wasn't wasn't David's head, but or excuse me, Goliath's head, but Goliath's sword. And that's supposed to be in the hands of some private collector. Thing is, though, all those kind of legends, there's a thousand of them, and most of them are, are fake, but some of them aren't. So, like, um, I think most of you know there's a legend that says in the very beginning, uh, when the Arabs were selling scrolls to the highest bidder, some of the scrolls, and this is true, some of the scrolls did get sold to private people in the very, very beginning. So what they were, who knows? But there are some people that say that there was a full Aramaic text of Enoch that was sold to private. And then I forget what it was. I was looking something the other day. I was finishing up a book. And uh, I was reading this uh, uh, other account from 40 or 50 years ago. They mentioned that there were, um, oh, that's what it was, R.H. Charles in his book on the volume one of the Pseudepigrapha had made a comment. He was going through the Syriac version of Daniel. There's just a couple little differences and he was talking about them. And he said that um, there was a rumor not only about a full Enoch, but that the lost five were found also. For those of you that don't know, that's Gad, Ahijah, Shemaiah, Ido, and the other guy that I always forget. Anyway, Ahijah, I think it was. So anyway, um, those are recorded as being people in the Dead Sea Scroll camp 
that ran the school of the prophets. Assumably, they would have records. Bible talks about them all writing books of prophecy in Kings and Chronicles. And we know the whereabouts abouts of some of them. We were able to get and publish Gad a few years ago. Amazing prophetical text. Uh, really helps to understand a few things. So like the Testament of Noah, the book of Gad, uh, Ezra Apocalypse, book of Revelation in the Bible, book of Daniel in the Bible, uh, some of the church father comments. You kind of pull all those together. Very, very fascinating. Um, is there any prophecy in Enoch or Dead Sea Scrolls about red heifers or the resuming of the sacrifice in these times? Not that I know of. So that would be pretty interesting. There are in other places, but not Dead Sea Scrolls. And I don't nothing about red heifers, I don't think, in Enoch. How could the Antichrist change the times and the laws? Anything in the DSS speak about that? Well, according to what they're saying, the Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a type of Antichrist, did exactly that. And to change the times and the laws about the calendar is changing the calendar. So that's one more thing about that. Um, it looks to me, though, like the Antichrist does that. And so that's that's confusing to me. If it's already been corrupted, why would he bother corrupting it yet again? He's not going to put it back, I don't think. You know, so it's there's more to the story. There's going to be another corruption or, or something else going on. But it is interesting that Atias's Antiochus Epiphanes did exactly that. That was one of the things I was wondering because they were Greeks or the, the culture was Greek. And I I, learned, I realized that there's each Greek city state had a slightly different calendar. So who knows, you know, but then it dawned on me that Antiochus in the Seleucid kingdom, what they would all have one calendar. That was his big deal. You pay me using the proper money on the proper date. So, so I looked that up and sure enough, that particular Greek calendar with uh, Antiochus Epiphanes in the Seleucid kingdom was lunar. Uh, leap month every three years, starts in the fall instead of the spring, just basically the modern Jewish calendar. So very fascinating. So yeah, there's more to that story than we know. See, this is the cool part. You guys are thinking, well, wait a minute, if that happens, what about this? I have no clue, but I may not even have thought of that. So if we keep having the same thoughts and pull our resources together or even our questions, we will eventually figure a lot of stuff out. This is really exciting to me. Could you explain the difference among evil spirits, demons, devil, and Satan? Well, the word Satan is, uh, it means adversary. So like in a, a court system, if you have a prosecutor and a defense lawyer, the prosecutor is the adversary. He's the Hasatan, the, the Satan. And so Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So it's actually a title. In uh, the fallen angel, we know is uh, the King James says Lucifer. In Isaiah, it actually says Hillel. And so that's the name of the fallen angel in particular. We call him Satan because he's the adversary. And then devil means something, I forget, but it's it's an English word or, or Saxon word that means something similar. Uh, and then there's evil spirits and unclean spirits. And I don't know if there's really a difference or if they're just saying unclean because they were, you know, half and half. And they're evil because of their nature. Uh, maybe it's all the same kind of spirit or whatever. Uh, demon comes from the Greek word daemon. And it just simply means a spirit. So generally speaking, if there's a spirit here trying to communicate with me, if my grandparents and my parents were saved, they're not going to be here. They're going to be with the father, right? According to what Paul said. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. So if they appear like their granddad or my father or something, it's probably not my father. And so if they're trying to deceive me by doing that, they would be demonic is what we would say. So that would be like a demon or a daemon, however you want to call that. King James, I think, calls them all devils. And they actually probably should be demons or a lot of times use that kind of stuff. So I think it, it just comes from which language it's coming from and how they're used. So I don't know if there is a difference between evil spirits and unclean spirits, but the rest of them are kind of titles or descriptions. 
but they're basically the spirits of the Nephilim that seek to possess people. And of course, Satan then is a fallen angel. They have their own, they're made a certain way. They have their own type of body. So they don't necessarily seek to uh, possess people. That's a good question. Watching one of your videos, and I was thinking, why was the debate over Moses' body mentioned? Only one. This might be this might be that he needed his body uncorrupted to appear as one of the witnesses. That's a possibility. That's that's a good point. Uh, the The main point of the story is that Michael is holy. He knows Satan does not have a claim to the body. And there's no reason for God to give the body to him. And it seems like it's a sin. Matter of fact, we all know it would be a sin. But just because that's the case doesn't mean you're supposed to step in there and stop it. And he didn't want to bring a railing accusation against himself, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, if the Lord would have said, okay, you're in charge. If he comes after the body, lock him up. You know, that would be different, you know. And so I, th I think the whole concept, they're talking about the, the weird Gnostics that are presuming, you know, do it my way and you'll be healed and all this kind of weird stuff. And so he's saying the, the, uh, the people coming out of Egypt, uh, the fallen angels, uh, the uh, Gnostics, and then uh, Michael, or, you know, Michael is the opposite. He's the one that didn't presume. So the whole thing is just teaching us not to presume or overstep our bounds. Like it says in, in the King James anyway, it says, you know, preserve your, your servant from presumptuous sins. Don't let me make a mistake in that sense and get myself in trouble or someone killed. So that's the point of the story. But it's interesting that he uses the stories that he did, the fallen angels of Genesis 6, the children of Israel coming out of the Egyptian exodus, the current Gnostics, and then Moses and uh, Michael and Lucifer. So we're supposed to be very familiar with all of those stories. So, and I, like I say, I don't know the whole detail on that particular one. So it would be really interesting to find and read because I think there's more there than what we realize. In the eternal state, I believe God will provide the light and there won't be any sun or moon. How will time be measured since there will be no be new fruit every month at the nation's healing? That is a really good question. I don't really know. I don't know if some of those are symbolic or if we're some other kind of thing. But it does say new heavens and new earth. So, and but it does talk about and you know, he's the light of of the new Jerusalem. So I'm not sure exactly how that works. But it seems like we would have some sort of time, uh, especially since we have the fruit trees doing one per month. Jacob took Esau's blessing from their father by deception. How can it be acceptable? Is it because Esau sold the birthright to Jacob? Does the Dead Sea Scroll or other documents talk about it? I don't think they talk about it in general. There's more to the story of that in the book of... Um, Jasher, I don't think it's nothing like that's in Jubilees. But um, yeah, I think the whole point of that is to recognize when God does something. So what I was taught in seminary is that um, Isaac had Jacob and Esau, and Esau was his favorite. So Isaac was, or I mean, uh, Esau was the, the hunter, the gatherer, the guy that can make the money, take the company further he could get stuff done. So he's my favorite. Jacob, not so much. He loves the Lord, which is good. I wish Esau would, you know, but it's that kind of stuff. He was more practical. And there was actually a prophecy that God wanted Jacob to take the blessing rather than uh, Esau. But uh, Isaac basically said, no, my firstborn son, he's my boy. He's getting the blessings. We're done. That's just all there is to it. And the thing we, we need to remember is if God really wanted it to happen, it would happen. So just wait and let it happen. But, he, but Jacob decided to <clears throat> listen to his mom 
take matters into their own hands and make it happen. So it says that he was punished because of that. He's overstepping his bounds, but it was God's plan for him to have that, just not through deception. And it did make Esau very upset, and he had a lot of problems because of it, risked his life because of it. And so I think <clears throat> as, as far as Isaac goes, what's interesting about the story is that when he realizes he's been duped, uh, Esau basically says that this was by deception. I'm me. You know who did this. So can't you just bless me? As an American, I would probably say, well, I was deceived. I didn't know what I was doing. So I want out of the contract. It's a null and void contract. I did not agree to this. This was, you know, manipulation. Um, and that's kind of how we would look at it. Uh, Isaac, though, at that point, even though he fought really hard to not have this, at that point, he realized what's done is done. God stepped in and did what God wanted to do. So now it's done. If you're going to continue fighting, it's one thing to say, no, I want my way. But when God has already done this, you don't keep saying, I want my way. You say, yes, Lord, I didn't want it this way, but whatever you want. And that's what he did. He accepted it. He actually told Esau, what I've blessed, I've blessed, and you will be his servant. Nothing I can do about it. So it's, it's that kind of a thing. It's not like you can undo this. And I think that's fascinating, the whole concept. And uh, it's not that he made a mistake. He just wanted his way. But at a certain point, and this is, I think, what Paul meant, why Paul mentions him in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11 is that, that particular thing. When you realize God's going to do it his way, you don't want to fight against God. I would have rather had that, but I want his will, but not mine. So it's a really fascinating study. When you go through Hebrews 11, you'll see that in a lot of places. There's a lot of, some of them immediately know what God wants and go with it, and some of them fight against it to a point. But the point is when they realize they turn tail, Paul fought against the Christians until he really realized he was in the wrong. He flipped around and became the best supporter of Christianity at that point. So that's that's an amazing testimony to have. But yeah, they don't it's not mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Could the the quote about the uh, days being shortened refer to the Torah age since the days after Christ died are all spoken of the last days. The tribulation is not shortened. All of Daniel's seven or, you know, it's another seven years. Um, I suppose that's possible. I'm not sure exactly what the days being shortened are. There's several theories about the daylight hours being shortened because of the extreme heat. And then there's other stuff about the number of hours in a day is shortened. And then other people believe that we're just talking about kind of like that, a time period is shortened in some way. And yeah, since the seven years are the seven years, um, I've come up with a theory. I could be totally wrong. But since the Dead Sea Scrolls talk about the time of repentance, uh in, in at the end of the first or into the second age rather when jesus the first came the first time the first coming was a 40-year period it had been prophesied as such uh the end of the first age was a 120-year period so it seems like those persecution uh times get shorter maybe more intense but shorter so if it was 120 and 40 and this one's only going to be seven it's definitely shorter than the others so that's another way of looking at it, too. And I really don't know if it's any of those or not. It's just one of those things that um, I've kind of learned not to speculate. I still do because I want to figure stuff out. But I would really love to find a scroll to tell me, no, that's not it. It's this. So that's what I, we keep looking for. Um, so it doesn't say anything to it. So I suppose that's a possibility. But I don't know for sure what the days being shortened mean. Wouldn't the high priest die if he entered the most holy place in the temple to sprinkle the blood on the altar of forgiveness of sin? Is there any record of this happening? 
Yes, actually there is. There's a record in the Talmud, and I mentioned this in one of the books. I forget which one. But there's a record from the Talmud that talks about from like about uh, 150 or so BC, like Mac Maccabee time period, when they start doing things wrong. But somewhere in that time period up, um, if you have a high priest that, you know, lives and acts as high priest for 30 years, you should have in that time period, maybe 150 priests or maybe not even that. But it recorded that there was uh, well over 300 high priests. It doesn't say anything else, just that they had a large number of priests. And my thought is, if I become priest, sometime this year I walk into the, the temple and I die, uh, then there's a new priest. And that starts happening every year. All of a sudden, some of the priests are going to not go in there. And so the rituals are going to be messed up and not happen. But I think it's interesting that totally unrelated, not commenting on anything. There's a record of, you know, three, four hundred priests in a very short time. That's pretty significant. So, yeah, that's it's really amazing when you read stuff like that. I'm wondering if the naming of the areas were done by Ezra. Oh, that's possible. I, I I imagine it's done by all the rabbis as time goes by. Something gets renamed, and then when I redo the story, sometimes you'll find a really old copy of something. And it'll say we went to whatever, and you're like, "There's no place like that around here." And you got to dig and dig and dig and find out that was the old name for that place over there. So it, um, I imagine it happens a lot because we're talking about six thousand years of human history, so things change a lot. What does it look like on the DSS calendar the day the sun stood still in Joshua 10, 13? Yeah, I don't, there's no, I mean, there's a record of that, of course, that, and then when the sundial went backwards in I think Zedekiah or Hezekiah's day, I don't think those would have any bearing on a day. So if the, if the sunlight stood still, whatever that was, reflection or, or time, whatever that was, you're talking about 40 minutes or something. For that, it was several hours, but it wasn't several days. So I don't know that it would make any difference in the years anyway. So there is no record about it. I've thought about that several times, but no matter what it is or how it worked, I don't think it would make any difference in the counting of the years. I think Chuck Missler's thought was that all the planets have a twin but one of them doesn't next to the asteroid belt. Okay. The destruction of the planet caused our year to increase the 4.25 days. Okay. Yeah. And that, that something like that could have actually happened. Uh, it doesn't seem to fit with this calendar, but it's, it's possible. Super chat, $10. Thank you again. Do prophecies always use the 360 day years like the trip? Not always, but there are several in scriptures that do. Uh, or do, do you also use the Essene calendar day counts to calculate? How do you know which one to use and when? Um, that's a good question. That's, that's the whole thing. We just try different ones and see which ones fit. For instance, there's that prophecy about the 1335 days in Daniel. And in English, it just looks like there's 1335 days from something to something. And but in the Hebrew, it's fairly clear that it's Moedim to Moedim. So a, a festival to a festival, like a Passover to Tabernacles or Tabernacles to Passover, something like that. But on the modern Jewish calendar, that's not possible. There's nothing, no matter how you do the, the seven festivals, or even if you plug in the others from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, they just simply don't fit. Now, if you use the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, though, there's one set that does fit. So that's what we're talking about. And then you look at the rituals and you'll understand immediately what the 1335 means. And you go a step further. So when you try this on the Essene calendar, or it works, 
you try it on the Pharisee Sadducee calendar, it doesn't. That kind of tells you something. So there's lots of things like that. Well, one of the things that Missler and um, Grant Jeffrey and several other people did was calculate the days according to the prophecy of Daniel, like four, six, and nine. But nine specifically, the the 32 A.D. time of the death, from the going forth of a command to rebuild Jerusalem, so many days to the Messiah's cut off is going to be exactly this number of days. Well, you know where those things were, so you can calculate them. And it comes out to, and they've both said this, uh, April 6th. Well, April 6th of that year is actually after the, the, the full moon. So it's after um, Passover. So how could it be Passover if it's after that? And that was always a confusing thing. And, and Grant Jeffrey and Chuck Missler both said, I don't know, but the prophecies were specific. It happened when it happened. I don't get that part, but, you know, maybe there's something more to it. Maybe the date we have back then is a week off or, or whatever. But um, but now with the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, for instance, April 6th of that year was Passover. It was the Tuesday of that year. So on that calendar, it fits perfectly. So it's just really interesting. There's a lot of things like that that we still don't know. It doesn't seem to quite match up because we're missing one little piece of the, the puzzle. So, but that's a good question. You just have to calculate them multiple ways and see which one fits. And then sometimes that may not even be correct, but you'll know at least the ones that definitely don't fit. So super chat, $20. Thank you very much. I just received end time prophecies in the book and the Enoch DVD featuring you and Gary Stearman in my recent order of the True Legends documentary series. Oh, okay. I am super excited to watch all of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for the donation. I hope you uh, like those. Yeah, Gary Stearman and I did a two-hour, something like that, on Enoch, looking at all the prophecies and things like that in there. And then we've got Ancient Prophecies Revealed, which is 500 prophecies in order of fulfillment when they were fulfilled in the book and uh, we also did an end time by the ancient church father so i'm not sure which one that is but we've done a lot of a lot of stuff like that and i think it's helped to uh, it's helped me at least figure stuff out and i think it's helped a lot of other people what book do you have the commands of christ listed in that would be the the one on first john or what's john jude um Let's see, biblefacts.org, always store rather. That would be um, the John Jude one. Commentaries. Here we go, John Jude. So this is about John and Jude and the Gnostics. So we've got Titus, Timothy, John Jude, and Daniel. Those, And I think we might have that chart that you're talking about. Let me go back to here. Under PDFs, I try to make a lot of that stuff available for free. Wait a minute, which one are we talking about? Commands of Christ. Yeah, this one here, commands. So that, let me back up here. If you go to the website, biblefacts.org, click on PDFs, and then web PDFs. It's the way it is right now anyway. I need to change that underline. That looks horrible. Uh, I'm seeing blue. Anyway, uh, commands of Christ. That's probably the one you're talking about. Old Testament commands, other than the commands for the priests sacrificing what what the priests and the kings and the jews and the uh not jews but the sanhedrin rather do if you pull those out because everyone's forbidden to do that stuff it runs it down to 70. so then we have the commands that jesus gave us 81 and then the commit we're just trying to compare laws together the law of god versus the law of moses that kind of stuff commands given by the apostles 124. And the 70, let's see, the 70, the 81 are in the 124. It's just a little more. <clears throat> this is just stuff like obey what the apostles tell you, you know, in addition to the other stuff. Uh, so, yeah, really interesting. See, I put that together because in, in 1 John, it says that we're to obey the commands of God or of Christ. And there's always this big debate on, you know, do, do you have to do the law of Moses? Do I have to sacrifice a goat? 
No, you do not do the law of Moses. <laughs> the law of Moses is a is a whole system of laws for Israel, and most of which would include Gentiles living in Israel. But even at that, there are laws for priests. Out, out of the 613 laws, it was said that close to 400 of them were only for priests. Ritual ceremonies when you're getting ready to sacrifice animals. That's what Levi did, not, not normal Jews. So even normal Jews don't do 400 of the 613. So it gets it down to that. So that's the, the kind of thing that we're trying to do. Hopefully that helps. And $10. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, donation. Okay, last question. Enoch stated the giants were 3,000 L's. How big is that in feet? That, that's got to be a, um, a scribal error. I think, and I'm not absolutely sure, but I think an L is the same thing as a cubit. So 3,000 would be like 50 feet tall or something like that. Uh, so no, cubits, that'd be, yeah, a cubit would be like uh, over a foot. So three, that'd be like uh, three, 4,000 feet, if that's what that was. Now, it could be uh, a garbling of a couple of different stories because I believe it says something like 3,000 cubits or something was the height of Mount Ararat where the ark landed. So when it says the entire earth was covered with water, it would be at least 3,000 feet. <clears throat> I might have that backwards, but anyway. It's either a, a, mis, a misprint from how tall the, the flood was, somebody assuming that if it was that tall, that's how tall the giants were, or an L is different. Or sometimes, and again, this is because it went from Hebrew to Giaz to Aramaic to um, English. And when you do that, things happen. A lot of times in these scrolls, I will see somebody adds an extra zero or takes a zero off. It's supposed to be 130 and it's 1300 or it's 13. I'll see stuff like that all the time. So, but there's no way, I don't think, biologically something could be that big. So it's got to be a scribal error of some sort. But good question. Okay, we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. Um, thank you all. And we'll be back next week with another study going forward with calendar and prophecy studies. God bless you guys. And happy Takufa.